Mother Teresa once said, be faithful in small things because it's in them that your strength lies. And while it may seem that she never studied the chemistry behind cement, she actually had a point. That's why in today's video, we'll see which are those small things that can affect the durability of something as massive as a dam. This is from Atoms to Dams, a project carried out by Jonathan Sanz, Monica Castellà, Patricio Asante and me, Daniel Plaza. Cement is a type of binder widely used in construction to produce concrete, the main construction material. Cement chemistry is a very complex subject, and in order to be simplified, we use the following nomenclature. C stands for calcium oxide, H for water, S for silica, A for alumina, S with a bar on top for sulfur oxide, etc. The production of cement is based on the clinkerization reaction, consisting of burning the raw materials, clays and limestone, until the four main phases of cement are formed, C3S, C2S, C3A and C4AF, which gives strength and dividing capability. Then the mixture is pulverized and some gypsum is added. Once this is done, we add a specific amount of water to achieve the so-called water to cement ratio, which is a very important parameter and should be around 0.40. It should be noticed that any excess of water could cause durability problems such as porosity. Finally, the components are hydrated producing a high release of heat, as we will see later. In order to make concrete, we add sand and gravel to the hydrating cement. This can be done either in the concrete plant or even in situ when it is required by the location of the worksite, such as for dams, which are usually in mountain areas with complicated access. Moreover, it's a common practice to use additions to improve some properties of cement or concrete, such as strength porosity, fire resistance, reduced heat of hydration, etc. Pozzolans or fly ashes are some examples. Finally, with respect, with respect to dams, there are two main types. On the one hand, we have gravity dams, which use their own weight to hold back the water thanks to its characteristic triangular shape with a much wider bottom. This enables these type of uh, dams to resist heavy pressures. And on the other hand, we have arc dams, that transfer the force to the hillsides with their curved, thinner and more complicated structure. However, less material is needed to build them. The first issue that we will see today is heat of hydration. When we mix cement with water, hydration takes place. This is an exothermic process, meaning that it releases heat. The first stage in the process, as we can see here, is the hydration of the phase called C3A right after mixing the cement with water, which produces CAH and the majority of the heat. Secondly, to prevent further quick setting, ettringite is formed, being one of the main phases of cement hydration. Thirdly, C3S and C2S hydrate too and release again a big amount of heat. These reactions form CH called Portlandite and CSH, a gel responsible for the binding capability. So as you can see, most of the heat is produced in the first hours of hydration, but it will also continue to be released in the next three months, but at lower rates. The main concern is that these changes in temperature produce an increase in the volume of concrete, and once it cools down, the volume decreases. Therefore, this can produce cracks in a process called thermal cracking. To prevent this, we can add different elements to the cement, such as ice cubes or additions such as fly ashes. Additionally, we can also install water pipes inside the structure of the dam to reduce the temperature of the concrete. We can also use um, either MCH or BCH cements, which in Spanish mean medium or low heat of hydration cement, and also a technique called roller compacted cement, which is a technique similar to road paving, where a layer of cement is placed, then compacted, and then another layer of cement is added on top. Therefore, the huge concrete dam is divided into smaller pieces and by doing so, the heat is entrapped in the interior. Freezing and thawing can generate a deterioration of the material. It is a common problem in cold places where temperature usually drops below zero degrees. Concrete absorbs water due to its porosity. When water freezes to ice, there is an increase of volume of 9%. If there isn't space enough, the increase of volume will generate inner tension. 
when the concrete is critically saturated, which is when approximately 91% of the pores are filled with water, some cracks may appear near to the surface of the structure. But the problem is the repetition of this cycle through, through successive winter seasons, resulting in a repeated loss of concrete surface. Adding a surface sol agent uh, to concrete mixture protects concrete from freezing throwing damage. This creates a large number of small air bubbles in the harder concrete that relieves the pressure build up caused by ice formation by acting as expansion chambers. The air bubbles should be well distributed and have a distance between each other of 0.25 millimeters in the cement paste. Sulfate attack. When concrete is put in surface conditions, it can react with sulfates, causing durability issues to the whole structure. And we, as engineers, need to be aware of their effect. The proximity to seawater or a sulfate-rich environment can be responsible for these kind of reactions, along with the damaging effects of sulfuric acid on concrete released from the bacterial action in sewers or the oxidation of sulfate minerals in clays adjacent to the concrete. There's an initial pathological reaction where soluble sulfates carried by fluids, mainly water, through the pores, along with its cations, react first to the porlandite, forming secondary gypsum. Afterwards, secondary gypsum reacts with the present hydrated aluminates and remaining non-hydrated C3A, leading to secondary etringite that, when crystallized, makes cement paste expand, creating unusual gaps. The delayed etringite formation, DEF, takes place under high temperatures, such as in the curing period, and the contact with water. As shown here, sulfate attack can cause serious damage to concrete structures. The negative effect is mainly the loss of strength due to the cracks and gaps resulting from the expansion of delayed etringite. Nonetheless, solutions to tackle these effects have been used. For instance, sulfate-resistant cement with low C3A to avoid DEF, high-quality and well-compacted concrete with a low water-to-cement ratio, an air and train admixture, high pressure steam curing and high lumina cement, as well as the pozzolans and special dust, to work efficiently in terms of sulfate attack. Alkali silicate attack. Generally, the persistent expansive problems that can appear in the concrete of a dam are motivated by certain chemical reactions that develop inside it. The alkali silica reaction is produced by a reaction between the alterate silicates that constitute the aggregate and the alkaline solution. The alkali silicate is described as a competition between the dissolution of the silicate and the formation of CSH, where if the silicate solution is faster than the formation of CSH, the reaction will not be blocked. This will lead to the polymerization of dissolved silica, which produces expansive gels. So mechanisms of expansion can be explained by the absorption of water by the silica gel, where the absorption is rapid and the volume increases faster than the possible dissipation of the gel in the pores. Internal tensions are produced and, of course, it will cause microcracking. Among the factors that affect the development of the reaction, we can mention the materials that constitute the concrete and the external actions that can be environmental and structural. The aggregates that are altered by chemical reactions are highly reactive. In many occasions, they can be altered by attacks of acid rain. Also, the smaller size of the aggregates, they're more like highly re reactive. On the other hand, we can also talk about external factors that can cause humidity because 
as we know, the water is the one that produces the expensive phenomenon. We can mention some dams that suffer alkaline silicate attack, like the dam of Salas that we have here, also the dam of Porto do Meuros, and Belezar Dam. As we have seen, very small reactions can have serious knock-on effects on very big structures as this is the case of dams. The majority of these concerns are related to the loss of strength due to the formation of cracks, which can be caused by the variation of temperature due to dehydration, freezing thawing cycles, and several chemical attacks such as sulfates or silicates that can seriously affect durability. Consequently, these reactions need to be taken into consideration and new ways to attenuate their effects must be investigated. Finally, we would like to thank our professor Ignasi Casanova, the UPC Camins Media Department and specifically Seferino Robledo, the librarians at Biblioteca Recto Gabriel Ferrate, and of course you for watching our video until the end. Thank you very much.